Welcome to the Sleep Charming Podcast, the podcast where I help you drift off for a good night's sleep or simply take a moment to relax. If you're enjoying the podcast, please leave a review or a rating. So sit back, take a deep breath, and let me read you an old story. In the fair land of Nova Scotia, a maritime province, there is a ridge called North Mountain, overlooking the Bay of Fundy on one side and the fertile Annapolis Valley on the other. On the northern slope of the range grows the hardy spruce tree, well adapted for ship timbers, of which many vessels of all classes have been built. The people of this coast, hardy, robust and strong, are disposed to compete in the world's commerce, and it is nothing against the master mariner of the birthplace mentioned on his certificate be Nova Scotia. I was born in a cold spot on the coldest North Mountain, on a cold February 20th. Though I am a citizen of the United States, a naturalized Yankee. If it may be said that Nova Scotians are not Yankees in the truest sense of the word, on both sides my family were sailors. And if any slocum should be found not seafaring, he will show at least an inclination to whittle models of boats and contemplate voyages. My father was the sort of man if wrecked on a desolate island would find his way home, if he had a jackknife and could find a tree. He was a good judge of a boat, but the old clay farm, which some calamity made his, was an anchor to him. He was not afraid of a capital wind, and he never took a back seat at a camping meeting or a good old-fashioned revival. As for myself, the wonderful sea charmed me from the first. At the age of eight, I had already been afloat along with the other boys on the bay with the chances greatly in favour of being drowned. When a lad, I filled the most important post of cook on a fishing schooner. But I was not long in the galley, for the crew mutinied at the appearance of my first duff, and chucked me out before I had a chance to shine as a culinary artist. The next step towards the goal of happiness found me before the mast in a full-rigged ship bound on a foreign voyage. Thus I came over the bows and not in through the cabin windows to the command of a ship. My best command was that of the magnificent Northern Light, of which I was a part owner. I had a right to be proud of her, for at that time, in the 80s, she was the finest American sailing vessel afloat. Afterward, I owned and sailed the Aquanac, a little bark which of all man's handiwork seemed to me the nearest to perfection of beauty, and which in speed, when the wind blew, asked no favours of steamers. I had been nearly twenty years a shipmaster when I quit her deck on the coast of Brazil, where she was wrecked. My home voyage to New York with my family was made in the canoe, Liberdade, without accident. My voyages were all foreign. I sailed as a freighter and trader principally to China, Australia and Japan, and among the Spice Islands. Mine was not the sort of life to make one long to coil up one's ropes on land, the customs and ways in which I had finally almost forgotten. And so when times for freighters got bad, as at last they did, and I tried to quit the sea. What was there for an old sailor to do? I was born in the breezes, and I had studied the sea as perhaps few men have studied it, neglecting all else. Next in attractiveness, after seafaring, came shipbuilding. I longed to be master in both professions, and in a small way, in time, I accomplished my desire. From the decks of stout ships in the worst gales, I had made calculations as to the size and sort of ship safest for all weather and all seas. Thus the voyage which I am on now to narrate was a natural outcome, 
not only of my love of adventure, but my lifelong experience. One midwinter day of 1892 in Boston, where I had been cast up from old ocean, so to speak, a year or two before, I was conjugating whether I should apply for a command, and again eat my bread and butter on the sea, or go to work at the shipyard, when I met an old acquaintance, a whaling captain, who said, Come to Fairhaven, and I'll give you a ship, but, he added, she wants some repairs. The captain's terms, when fully explained, were more than satisfactory to me. They included all the assistance I would require to fit the craft for sea. I was only too glad to accept, for I had already found that I could not obtain work in the shipyard without first paying $50 to a society. As for a ship to command, there were not enough ships to go around. Nearly all our tall vessels had been cut down for coal barges, and were being ignominiously towed by the nose from port to port. While many worthy captains addressed themselves to sailors' snug harbour, the next day I landed in Fairhaven, opposite New Bedford, and found that my friend had something of a joke on me. For seven years the joke had been on him. The ship proved to be a very antiquated sloop called the Spray, which the neighbours declared had been built in the year one. She was affectionately propped up in a field, some distance from salt water, and was covered with canvas. The people of Fairhaven, I hardly need say, are thrifty and observant. For seven years they had asked, I wonder what Captain Eben Pierce is going to do with the old spray. The next day I appeared, there was a buzz at the gossip exchange. At last, someone had come and was actually going to work on the old spray. Breaking her up, I suppose? No, going to rebuild her. Great was the amazement. Will it pay? was the question which for a year or more I answered by declaring that I would make it pay. My axe felled a stout oak tree nearby for a keel, and Farmer Howard, for a small sum of money, hauled in this and enough timbers for the frame of the new vessel. I rigged a steam box and a pot for a boiler, the timbers for ribs being straight saplings, were dressed and steamed till supple, and then bent over a log where they were secured till set. Something tangible appeared every day to show for my labour, and the neighbours made the work sociable. It was a great day in the spray shipyard when her new stem was set up and fastened to the new keel. Whaling captains came from far to survey it. With one voice they pronounced it, A-1 and in their opinion, fit to smash ice. The oldest captain shook my hand warmly when the breast hooks were in, declaring that he could see no reason why the spray should not cut in bowhead yet off the coast of Greenland. The much esteemed stem piece was from the butt of the smartest kind of pasture oak. It afterwards split a coral patch in two at the Keeling Islands and did not receive a blemish. Better timber for a ship than pasture white oak never grew. The breast hooks, as well as all the ribs, were all of this wood, and were steamed and bent into shape as required. It was hard upon March when I began to work in earnest. The weather was cold, still, there were plenty of inspectors to back me with advice. When a whaling captain hove in sight, I just rested a while and gammed with him. New Bedford, the home of whaling captains, is connected with Fairhaven by a bridge. And the walking is good. They never worked along up to the shipyard too often for me. It was the charming tales about Arctic whaling that inspired me to put a double set of breast hooks in the spray that she might shunt ice. The seasons came quickly while I worked. Hardly were the ribs of the sloop up before apple trees were in bloom. 
Then the daisies and the cherries came soon after, close by the place where the old spray had now dissolved rested the ashes of John Cook, a reserved pilgrim father. So the new spray rose from hallowed ground. From the deck of the new craft, I could put out my hand and pick cherries that grew over the little grave. The planks for the new vessel, which I soon came to put on, were of Georgian pine, an inch and a half thick. The operation of putting them on was tedious, but when on, the caulking was easy. The outward edges stood slightly open to receive the caulking, but the inner edges were so close that I could not see daylight between them. All the butts were fastened by through bolts, with screw nuts tightening them to the timbers, so that there would be no complaint from them. Many bolts with screw nuts were used in other parts of the construction, and all about a thousand. It was my purpose to make the vessel stout and strong. Now, it is a law in Lloyd's that the Jane repaired all out in the old until she's entirely new is still the Jane. The spray changed her being so gradually that it was hard to say at what point the old died and the new took birth. And it was no matter. The bulwarks I built up of white oak stanchions 14 inches high and covered with 7 8 inch white pine. The stanchions mortised through a 2 inch covering board. I corked with thin cedar wedges. They have remained perfectly tight ever since. The deck I made of 1 and a half inch by 3 inch white pine spiked to beams 6 by 6 inches of yellow or Georgia pine placed three feet apart. The deck enclosures were one over the aperture of the main hatch, six feet by six for a cooking alley, and a trunk further aft, about ten feet by twelve for a cabin. Both of these rose about three feet above the deck and were sunk sufficiently into the hall to afford headroom. In the spaces along the sides of the cabin, under the deck, I arranged a berth to sleep in, and shelves for small storage, not forgetting a place for the medicine chest. In the midship hold, that is, the space between the cabin and galley, under the deck was room for provisions of water, salt beef, etc. Ample for many months. The hull of my vessel being now put together as strongly as wood and iron could make her, and the various rooms partitioned off, I set about caulking ship. Grave fears were entertained by some that at this point I should fail. I myself gave some thought to the advisability of a professional caulker. The very first blow I struck on the cotton with my caulking iron, which I thought was right many others thought wrong. It'll crawl, cried a man from Marion, passing with a basket of clams on his back. It'll crawl, cried another from West Island, when he saw me driving cotton into the seams. Bruno simply wagged his tail. Even Mr. Ben Jay, a noted authority on whaling ships, whose mind, however, was said to totter, asked rather confidently, if I did not think it would crawl. How fast will it crawl? cried my old captain friend, who had been towed by many a lively sperm whale. Tell us how fast, he cried, that we may get into port in time. However, I drove a thread of oakum on top of the cotton, as from the first I had intended to do, and Bruno again wagged his tail. The cotton never crawled. When the caulking was finished, two coats of copper paint were slapped on the bottom. Two of white lead, the rudder was then shipped and painted, and on the following day, the spray was launched. As she rode at her ancient rust-eaten anchor, she sat on the water 
like a swan. The spray's dimensions were, when finished, 36 feet 9 inches long, all over, 14 feet 2 inches wide, 4 feet 2 inches deep in the hold, her tonnage being 9 tons net and 12 and 71 hundredths tons gross. Then the mast, a smart New Hampshire spruce, was fitted, and likewise all the smaller pertinents necessary for a short cruise. Sails were bent, and away she flew with my friend Captain Pierce and me, across Buzzard's Bay on a trial trip, all right. The only thing that now worried my friends along the beach was, will she pay? The cost of my new vessel was $553.62 for materials, and 13 months of my own labour. I was several months more than that at Fairhaven, for I got work now and then on an occasional whale ship fitting farther down harbour, and that kept me the overtime. I spent a season in my new craft fishing on the coast, only to find that I had not the cunning properly to bait a hook. But at last, the time arrived to weigh anchor and get to sea in earnest. I had resolved on a voyage around the world. And as the wind on the morning of April 24th, 1895, was fair at noon, I weighed anchor, set sail and filled away from Boston where the spray had been moored smugly all winter. The twelve o'clock whistles were blowing just as the sloop shot ahead under full sail. A short board was made upon the harbour on the port tack, then coming about the stood seaward, with her boom well off to port, and swung past the ferries with lively heels, a photographer on the outer pier at East Boston got a picture of her, her flag at the peak throwing its fold clear. A thrilling pulse beat high in me. My step was light on the deck in the crisp air. I felt that there could be no turning back, and that I was engaging in an adventure, the meaning of which I thoroughly understood. I had taken little advice from anyone, for I had a right to my own opinions in matters pertaining to the sea. That the best of sailors might do worse than even I alone was borne in upon me not a league from Boston docks, where a great steamship, fully manned, officered and piloted, lay stranded and broken. This was the Venetian. She was broken completely in two over a ledge. So in the first hour of my lone voyage, I had proof that the spray could at least do better than this full-handed steamship, for I was already farther on my voyage than she. Take warning, spray, and have care, I uttered out loud to my bark, passing fairy-like silently down the bay. The wind freshened, and the spray rounded Deer Island light at the rate of seven knots. Passing it, she squared away direct for Gloucester to procure there some fishermen's stores. Waves dancing joyously across Massachusetts Bay met her coming out of the harbour to dash them into myriads of sparkling gems that hung about her at every surge. The day was perfect, the sunlight clear and strong. Every particle of water thrown into the air became a gem and the spray, bounding ahead, snatched necklace after necklace from the sea, and as often threw them away. We have all seen miniature rainbows about a ship's prow, but the spray flung out a bow of her on that day, such as I had never seen before. Her good angel had embarked on a voyage. I so read it in the sea. Bold Nahant was soon abeam, then Marblehead was put astern. Other vessels were outward bound, but none of them passed the spray, flying along on her course. I heard the clanking of the dismal ball on Norman's woe as we went by, 
and the reef where the schooner Hespera stuck, I passed close aboard. The bones of a wreck, tossed up, lay bleaching on the shore abreast, the wind still freshening. I settled the throat of the mainsail to ease the sloop's helm, for I could hardly hold her before it with the whole mainsail. A schooner ahead of me lowered all sail and ran into port under bare poles, the wind being fair. As the spray brushed by the stranger, I saw that some of his sails were gone, a much broken canvas hung in his rigging from the effects of a squall. I made for the cove, a lovely branch of Gloucester's fine harbour, again to look the spray over and again to weigh the voyage, and my feelings and all that. The bay was feather white as my little vessel tore in, smothered in foam. It was my first experience of coming into port alone, with a craft of any size and in among shipping. Old fishermen ran down to the wharf for which the spray was heading, apparently intent upon branding herself there. I hardly know how a calamity was averted, but with my heart in my mouth, almost, I let go the wheel, stepped quickly forward, and down the jib. The sloop naturally rounded in the wind, and just ranging ahead, laid her cheek against a mooring pile at the windward corner of the wharf, so quietly after all, that she would not have broken an egg. Very leisurely, I passed a rope around the post, and she was moored. Then a cheer went up from the little crowd on the wharf. You couldn't have done it better, cried an old skipper, if you weighed a ton. Now my weight was rather less than the fifteen part of a ton, but I said nothing, only putting on a look of careless indifference to say for me. Oh, that's nothing, for some of the ablest sailors in the world were looking at me, and my wish was not to appear green, for I had mind to stay in Gloucester several days. Had I uttered a word, it surely would have betrayed me, for I was still quite nervous and short of breath. I remained in Gloucester about two weeks, fitting out the various articles for the voyage most readily obtained there. The owners of the wharf where I lay, and of many fishing vessels, put on board dry cod galore, also a barrel of oil to calm the waves. They were old skippers themselves and took a great interest in the voyage. They also made the spray a present out of a fisherman's own lantern which I found I would throw a light a great distance round. Indeed, a ship that would run another down having such a good light aboard would be capable of running into a light ship. A gaff, a pew, and a dip net, all of which an old fisherman declared I could not sail without, were also put on board. Then top, from across the cove, came a case of copper paint, a famous anti-fouling article which stood me in good stead long after. I slapped two coats of this paint on the bottom of the spray while she lay a tide or so on the hard beach. For the boat to take along, I made a shift to cut a castaway dory in two atwood ships, boarding up the end where it was cut. This half dory I could hoist in and out by the nose easily enough by hooking the throat hail yards into a stroop fitted for purpose. A whole dory would be heavy and awkward to handle alone. Manifestly, there was not room on deck for more than the half of a boat, which after all was better than no boat at all, and was large enough for one man. I perceived, moreover, that the newly arranged craft would answer for a washing machine when placed at wart ships, and also for a bathtub indeed. For the former office, my Rosied Dory gained such a reputation on the voyage that my washerwoman at Samoa would not take no for an answer. She could see with one eye that it was a new invention which beat any Yankee notion ever brought by missionaries to the island, and she had to have it. 
the want of a chronometer for the voyage was all that worried me now. In our newfangled notions of navigation, it is supposed that a mariner could not find his way out without one. And I had myself drifted into this way of thinking. My old chronometer, a good one, had been long in disuse. It would cost $15 to clean and rate it. $15. For sufficient reasons, I left that timepiece at home, where the Dutchman left his anchor. I had the great lantern, and a lady in Boston sent me the price of a large two-burner cabin lamp, which lightened the cabin at night, and by some small contriving served for a stove during the day. Being thus refitted, I was once more ready for sea, and on May 7th again made sail. With little room in which to turn, the spray, in gathering headway, scratched the paint of an old, fine weather craft in the fairway. Being puttied and painted for a summer voyage. Who'll pay for that? growled the painters. I will, I said. With the main sheet, echoed the captain of the Bluebird close by, which was his way of saying that I was off. There was nothing to pay for above five cents worth of paint, maybe, but such a din was raised between the, the old hooker and the Bluebird, which now took up my case, and the first cause of it was forgotten altogether. Anyhow, no bill was sent after me. The weather was mild on the day of my departure from Gloucester. On the point ahead, as the spray stood out of the cove, was a lively picture. For the front of a tall factory was a flutter of handkerchiefs and caps. Pretty faces peered out of their windows from the top to the bottom of the building, all smiling bon voyage. Some hailed me to know where away and why alone. Why, when I was made as if to stand in, a hundred pairs of arms reached out and said come, but the shore was dangerous. The sloop worked out of the bay against a light southwest wind, and about noon squared away off Eastern Point, receiving at the same time a hearty salute, the last of many kindnesses to her at Gloucester. The wind freshened off the point and skipping along smoothly. The spray was soon off Thatcher's Island Lights, thence shaping her course east by compass to go north of Cash's Ledge and the Amon Rocks. I sat and considered the matter all over again and asked myself once more whether it were best to sail beyond the ledge and rocks at all. I had only said that I would sail around the world in the spray, dangers of the sea excepted, but I must have said it very much in earnest. The charter party with myself seemed to bind me, and so I sailed on. Toward night, I hauled the sloop to the wind and baited a hook, sounded for bottom fish in thirty fathoms of water on the edge of Cash's ledge. With fair success, I hauled till dark, landing on deck three cod and two haddocks, one hake, and best of all, a small halibut, all plump and spry. This, I thought, would be the place to take in a good stock of provisions above what I already had. So I put out a sea anchor that would hold her head to windward, the current blowing southwest against the wind. I felt quite sure I would find the spray still on the bank, or near it in the morning. Then stradding the cable and putting my great lantern in the rigging, I lay down, for the first time, at sea, alone. Not to sleep, but to doze, and to dream. I had read somewhere of a fishing schooner hooking her anchor into a whale, and being towed a long way and at great speed. This was exactly what happened to the spray in my dream. I could not shake it off entirely when I awoke and found that it was the wind blowing and the heavy sea now running that had disturbed my short rest. A scud was flying across the moon. A storm was brewing, indeed. It was already stormy. I reefed the sails, then hauled in my sea anchor and setting what canvas the sloop could carry, 
headed her away for Monhegan Light, which she made before daylight on the morning of the 8th. The wind being free, I ran on into Round Pond Harbour, which is a little port east from Pemaquid. Here I rested a day while the wind rattled among the pine trees on shore. But the following day was fine enough and I put to sea, first writing up my log from Cape Anne, not omitting a full account with my adventure with the whale. The spray heading east stretched along the coast among many islands and over a tranquil sea. At evening of this day, May 10th, she came up with a considerable island, which I shall always think of as the Island of Frogs, for the spray was charmed by a million voices. From the Island of Frogs, we made for the Island of Birds, called Gannet, called Gannet Island, and sometimes Gannet Rock, whereon is a bright, intermittent light, which flashed fitfully across the spray's deck as she coasted along under its light and shade. Thence shaping a course for Briar's Island, I came among vessels the following afternoon on the western fishing grounds, and after speaking a fisherman at anchor, who gave me a wrong course, the spray sailed directly over the southwest ledge through the worst tide race in the Bay of Fundy, and got into Westport Harbour in Nova Scotia, where I had spent eight years of my life as a lad. The fisherman may have said east southeast, the course I was steering when I hailed him, but I thought he said east northeast, and I accordingly changed it to that. Before he made up his mind to answer me at all, he improved the occasion of his own curiosity to know where I was from, and if I was alone, and if I didn't have no dog nor no cat. It was the first time in all my life at sea that I had heard a hail for information answered by a question. I think the chap belonged to the foreign islands. There was one thing I was sure of, and that was that he did not belong to Briar's Island, because he dodged a sea that slooped over the rail, and stopping to brush the water from his face, lost a fine cod which was about his ship. My islander would not have done that, it is known that at Briar Island, fish or no fish on his hook never flinches from a sea. He just tends to his lines and hauls or soars. Nay, have I not seen my old friend Deacon W.D., a good man of the island, while listening to a sermon in the little church on the hill, reach out his hand over the door of his pew and jig imaginary squid in the aisle? To the intense delight of the young people who did not realise that to catch good fish, one must have good bait, the thing most on Deacon's mind. I was delighted to reach Westport. Any port at all would have been delightful after the terrible thrashing I got in the first southwest rip, and to find myself among old schoolmates now was charming. It was the 13th of the month, and thirteen is my lucky number, a fact registered long before Dr. Nansen sailed in search of the North Pole with his crew of thirteen. Perhaps he had heard of my success in taking a most extraordinary ship successfully to Brazil with that number of crew. The very stones on Briar's Island I was glad to see again, and I knew them all. The little shop round the corner, which for 35 years I had not seen, was the same, except that it looked a deal smaller. It wore the same shingles, I was sure of it. For did not I know the roof where we boys, night after night, hunted for the skin of a black cat to be taken on a dark night to make a plaster for a poor lame man? Lowry, the tailor, lived there when boys were boys. In his day, he was fond of the gun. He always carried his powder loose in the tail pocket of his coat. He usually had in his mouth a short dudeen, 
but in an evil moment he put the doudine, lighted, in the pocket among the powder. Mr. Lowry was an eccentric man. At Briar's Island I overhauled the spray once more and tried her seams, but found that even the test of the southwest rip had started nothing. Bad weather and much headwind prevailing outside. I was in no hurry to round Cape Sable. I made a short excursion with some friends to St. Mary's Bay, an old cruising ground and back to the island. Then I sailed, putting into Yarmouth the following day, on an account of fog and headwind. I spent some days pleasantly enough in Yarmouth, took in some butter for the voyage, also a barrel of potatoes, filled six barrels of water, and stowed all under deck. At Yarmouth too, I got my famous tin clock, the only timepiece I carried on the whole voyage. The price of it was a dollar and a half, but on account of the face being smashed, the merchant let me have it for a dollar.